Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Anne Marie Baker. I'm an occupational therapist. And I suppose the reason you're all here today is to find out a little bit more about sensory processing, what the difficulties may look like, and hopefully some strategies that you can try to implement um, in the home environment. So just wanted to start off a little bit by defining a little bit what sensory processing actually is, because it's a it's a complex term and it's used a lot, I think, when, when we go and do our own personal research. But it does, in a nutshell, refer to the way that our brain interprets the information we get from our senses. And there are many times within perhaps your own children where some of that information is getting a little bit mixed up. And you can almost refer to it like a traffic jam in the brain. The, the information is coming in, but sometimes the way that it is interpreted or filtered or that your child responds to it is sometimes of a different reaction, whether they might over respond, under respond um, to, to some of the different input that's coming in. And we really need to try and address some of these difficulties when it starts to impact their daily functioning. And that could be within their social, their emotional, their learning environments, participation in their daily living activities can all be impacted by difficulties with sensory processing. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about each of the eight senses that we have. Most of, us, most of us are very familiar with the first five that you see on this slide. And then we're gonna be talking about also the vestibular system, which has to do with movement, the proprioceptive system, which has to do with your body awareness, knowing where your limbs are and how they're moving through space. And then we'll also talk about interoception, which has to deal with how we respond to the cues relating to things like toileting, to thirst, hunger, etc. So the main goal of sensory processing is I suppose to achieve an optimal state of self-regulation. And that's pretty you know, pretty good to define it through this picture you see, which is of a thermostat. We aim to be at a, a controlled level where we feel good within ourselves. We feel calm, we feel alert, we feel ready to function, and we can take in the information around us and communicate with people as well. Oftentimes, though, if our system is working too high or too low, it really does impact the way that we're able to perform um, some of our daily functioning. And that's, like I said, when we need to try and make some changes or address it um, by using different strategies, using different equipment and techniques in order to, um, to still be able to cope with the demands that our children have in their daily lives. So on this slide, there's a lot of different comments, but you might identify your child or um, you know, a family member um, based on some of these statements that are on here. And I'll just read a couple um, that can be indicative of some sensory processing uh, dysfunction. So one is I'm a picky eater and I resist foods and textures. I complain about tags in my clothing. I always walk on my tiptoes. I put my socks on just so or maybe I never go barefoot. I hate being tickled or cuddled. I chew on everything. I have poor fine motor skills such as handwriting and cutting. I am overly sensitive to loud sounds such as vacuums and blenders. I hate having my hair washed, brushed or cut. And this is just to name a few. Um, so there's others on there that you might find you, you recognize within your child. There are, if some of you have had an assessment by an occupational therapist, some of these terms may be familiar to you. And what you might read in some of them are how your child displays a certain profile. And it's very rare that your child will just be one of these terms. Um, we are often a mix. We can be hypersensitive or over responsive to things like noise, but then we can be under responsive 
to things like movement where we need so much movement in order to keep our system in a regulated state. And then we can also be sensory seeking. So really needing to put everything in the mouth, for example. So depending on the child's sensory system, they might fall into some of these different categories. And that's sort of what helps to guide a treatment process or a therapeutic approach um, to address their areas of difficulty. So just being mindful that it's, it's constantly changing as well. Your child's profile today at this point in time will differ from perhaps six months, six years from now when they're going through growth spurts, um, when they are going through puberty with the hormonal changes, if they are making a transition um, to a different environment, whether that be for school or you're actually moving house, um, and all that that brings um, in terms of the, the sensory information that they are then having to filter, um, it will manifest itself perhaps in a, a change within their sensory profile. So if you've had a, an OT assessment and a review at age four, well, at 14, it's, it could potentially look very, very different. So it's important to sort of always keep, keep tabs on it, keep asking ourselves the questions um, that we're going to go through today um, to determine how best to respond. So we're now going to look at what the difficulties may look like if a child over responds or under responds in all of the sensory systems. And I always try and make a comparison to playing a detective because as a parent or a caregiver, this is essentially what you are needing to do throughout your entire day. You're trying to understand and unpick what behaviors you're, you're seeing and what maybe your child was trying to communicate to you, what happened before that they had to get away from that situation or away from that stimulus, or perhaps it was that they were seeking it out and needed more of it. But we are always in this you know, constant state of just really needing to break it all down and, and play that detective. So if we think, for example, the visual system, there are different elements. It's not about how you see, and if you have 20-20 vision, it's how you're processing the things that you see and interpreting that. So for example, things like lighting, there are some children who do prefer to be in the dark and cut off that direct sunlight because they find that quite painful. Uh, whereas other children do like to have lots and lots of brightness around them, bright colored clothing, they'll seek some of extra visual input out. Um, you may have some children who are very, very bothered by a distraction outside of a plain wall. I just saw a child recently who um, they had a patterned wallpaper that was in their lounge with the television in front of it and he would not sit still when they would try and have some time together on the sofa in the evening. He was constantly fidgeting, moving around. They had no idea why he couldn't vocalize it and perchance they happened to redecorate and had it completely plain as a background and he calmed completely. It just had that, uh, that, that reaction within him that he could not settle. It was too bothersome as a pattern that he, his mind just couldn't process it and it, it created too much of a distraction. Um, locating objects as well. So the example that I tend to use for this is if you ask your child to um, go upstairs to get a jumper that you know for certain is in their bedroom, but it's also amongst um, other articles of clothing, toys, books, etc., perhaps on a patterned carpet, and they cannot locate it at all. They just can't make out the foreground from the background, can't quite make sense of locating that specific object. So even when you're opening up a drawer that's full of cutlery, perhaps, and you're saying, can you get the spoon if it's jumbled up with many other items? That is another example that you might see as well in terms of them being able to visually hone in and locate that one specific item you're trying to, uh, to get. So I suppose just going back to that as well too is, you know, we then might need to make some adjustments in terms of limiting the distractions that are in a background. So um, if, 
you know, if you can make, um, make it so that the, the background perhaps is plain or that if there is um, a, a window, which you know there's a lot of um, activity that passes by, whether that's people or trees that, that, you know, constantly the leaves that are blowing around and that just catches their attention. It's just about being mindful of how the environment is set up and maybe how to, to minimize some of those distractions. And if we can't, then I suppose it's trying to just have times within the day when we can just shut off from some of that visual stimulation. And just even if it's closing your eyes for a few minutes, or like I mentioned earlier, maybe just sitting in a room where there's fewer lights that are on, it's sort of dampening down some of that stimulation so that their brains have a chance to just recover and cope from everything they're having to visually process throughout a day, because it can be quite tiring. And that can be the same for auditory information as well too. You might have a child who really dislikes any types of loud noises, so whether that's the Hoover or hand dryers, if you're out in the community. I know that I had to, with my own children as well, give them warning when that, was, that device was going to be used or if I could see someone going towards it to try and move them away or say, could you just wait a minute while we finish up, you know, I've got my paper towel from the toilet and I'd rather than use that so that it wouldn't create a negative reaction uh, within my child. Um, there are times where I do see some children who have good success with putting things like ear defenders on. Some of the older children prefer to put their earbuds in or even putting up the hood of their hoodie. So it just help, it happens to dampen down the sounds a little bit. Um, often too, the sounds can be very distracting and sometimes those sounds all come in at the exact same volume. So you might be speaking to your child in the kitchen and the washing, the dishwasher is going, the washing machine might be going as well. Perhaps there's a drip from the sink. There might be a hum coming from your refrigerator. If you imagine all those sounds that are competing for their attention are coming in at the same volume, it's very hard for them to unpick what I need to focus on. Is it your voice or is it that sound? So you're trying to get their attention. They're not looking at you and you're having to repeat over and over again. It's again, having opportunities within the day when we can try and cut out some of the auditory stimulation that, um, that is passing through their system. Um, so times of quiet are important, just again, so their system can recover. And what you might find is that your child is making their own noises as a way to block out what it is that they're hearing so they can focus on that one regulating hum or with their singing their own sound to, to help bring about some degree of calm and um, make them feel regulated. So taste and smell often go hand in hand, whether your child struggles with different food textures or combinations of food items, whether that's touching on the plate or a mix of sauces, colors perhaps as well too that they stick to because they find them quite safe. Um, you might find your child gags if they're quite hypersensitive within the mouth area. This can make things like tooth brushing and any oral hygiene trips to the dentist very, very difficult. Um, and then as an aside, this is an area where there's a little bit of overlap between speech and language therapy and occupational therapy. And depending on um, what your therapist can offer you or training that they may have done, you can look a little bit more specifically on how to desensitize in and around the mouth, the lips, looking at the cheeks and the movements of the tongue. Um, and they can give you a lot of extra support and advice on pieces of equipment that might be suitable. Um, and also just some brushing types of techniques that you can do. So it is worth having the conversation to see if your child would benefit from something like that. You might find that your child seeks a lot of uh, oral stimulation as well too by biting and chewing on clothing or other objects. I think one parent mentioned that they got the, the Minecraft Chewy. Uh, again, it's finding the, the safe and appropriate items for your child to be putting in their mouth. Um, you know, we don't want them to be chewing their pencil where they might end up getting pieces of metal, pieces of rubber, paint in their mouth. So you can sometimes get 
um, pencil toppers that can go on the end and they can have that um, to chew while they're doing a writing task because the chewing often relates to that need to get some calming deep pressure and the mouth is very sensitive as we all know if we've experienced um, a toothache or an abscess you can't ignore the pain um, and for children you know again through the jaw and through biting they get an instant reaction of some degree of pressure so sometimes it could be a sensory seeking i need that pressure now i need it fast the quickest way that i can get this will be to bite through something um, and they'll bite themselves or perhaps you or a sibling um, so it's trying to maybe within the day offering them more crunchy and resistive snacks things like uh, dried fruit frozen fruit ice chips a couple of pieces of, of gum if they if they can manage that well within their mouth to get a lot of, of heavy deep pressure through the jaw um, to help meet that need so that it might then reduce the amount of chewing or biting um, to other people or to themselves and obviously there are, there's multiple different uh, resources out there whether it's around the, the wrist um, as like a bracelet or um, around the neck and they they look like jewelry really and the child can take an opportunity to, to choose one of their liking to help to, to meet their need and, and feel that that is an acceptable piece of equipment for them. And then you might find that a child as well too has to smell everything or they're smelling objects they need to get some extra sensory information um, before they handle an item and that doesn't necessarily have to be an edible item it could be a pencil but it's not one that they've seen before so they just want to make sure it's safe and that just happens to be something that they that they want to do other children are really hyper hypersensitive to different smells um, can't tolerate if um, a mother or father is using different types of cleaning products or if cologne and perfume are worn, um, different smells within um, you know, a school hall or in a restaurant. It can make sometimes these social outings very, very difficult, even percolating coffee, you know, that can be quite strong. Um, and for these children, that is can be really, really off-putting and generate a very negative reaction. Um, so it's just being mindful that if all of a sudden you're brewing a coffee and your child lashes out, it's like, what happened there? You know, what, what was it that may have just tipped their sensory system a little bit to have created or caused that response? So tactile or touch, you might find that your child seeks out a lot of tactile input and they might constantly be touching you, be touching surfaces, objects around them, anything left on the table, they're constantly grabbing for it and need to have something to handle in their hands. And then the other side of that would be a child who doesn't really notice when they're being touched. If you come into a room behind them, put a hand on their shoulder, they might not respond to that light touch. It could be that their system needs extra deep pressure, lots of um, like I said, the deep pressure touch just to be able to register a person's presence or to register their own body as well. Um, and if a child is quite, um, you know, into wanting to get some of that extra deep pressure, that's when they will gravitate more towards the rough and tumble type play um, and really need to get a lot more of that deep pressure. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in the next slide. But if your child really doesn't like the light touch, they might find it very difficult when you go out and there's a crowded environment or if you have to queue when people are brushing up against them it might be even very difficult to leave the house because they don't feel comfortable within the clothing that uh, that they have to put on whether that's just through tags or whether there is uh, a picture on the t-shirt but they can feel it from the inside it just doesn't feel right. If there's any type of seam, they're, they're ultra aware of it. Um, it. It can be hugely um, impacting daily life and really make any type of uh, ability to leave the house quite significant and difficult uh, as a family. So that's something again that we can look through um, some type of occupational therapy input, whether that's like a brushing and joint compression program where we look to try and normalize what some of those touch responses are 
Um, and that would be, again, a conversation worth having with your occupational therapist to see if there's ways to, to help your child tolerate touch and normalize their responses. Um, because there are times when if they really don't like touching anything or being touched, they won't engage in things like messy play, it'll make it more difficult for them to develop hand function and using things like scissors or cutlery or being able to manipulate um, any sort of fastenings on, on a coat or a jumper. Very difficult because they, they, they haven't had the experiences and they lack that degree of fine motor dexterity to be able to handle those kinds of objects. So it does have a knock-on effect when they really are ultra sensitive um, and it's something that does need to, to be looked at and, you know, whether that's trying to desensitize them through messy play or giving them some safe opportunities. And like I said, doing brushing, lots and lots of weight bearing on the open hands. If your child didn't crawl, you imagine all that lost opportunity for the pressure that they would have got through their hands. Sometimes that can lead on further to uh, a, a bit of tactile sensitivity when they're when they're um, a little bit older on we start to notice it and unpick it a little bit and say I wonder where this may have come from and in conversations with your OT that might uh, that might come to light so for the vestibular system we spoke about movement and um, the receptors for that are in your inner ear so it's a child's response to really a change in body position. So if their head, you know, moves to the side or they go upside down, they will, you know, likely notice that their, their body position has changed. Some children don't like to move at all. They just feel very unsafe, unsteady. Um, they're very fearful. So they almost move quite stiffly through their environment and move almost as a unit. Um, really don't like the idea of, of feet leaving the ground and have that gravitational insecurity. Um, this is one side of the spectrum. And then what you might see is that your child actually just needs to move all the time, that the idea to sit to do an activity is, is non-existent, that they'd rather stand, um, even to eat a meal or pick at it, run away for a bit, come back, have another bite or so. They just constantly rocking, moving, uh, jumping around, fidgeting so much um, that, you know, that does impact obviously, again, family life. And of course, if they do attend school, that can also be an area that um, comes up quite a bit in discussions with their educators. Um, so what's important to recognize is that if your child does need movement, are they getting enough of it throughout the day? Because what I've found in speaking to some families is that if they're not getting enough at regular intervals, and I'll say as a guide, really about every 90 minutes or so, that they need to have a lot of that extra bit of, of movement, quite high intensity, um, just to feed the system throughout the day. If they're not getting it, they might have a much harder time settling at night. And they just, they're, they're still moving. They're still you know, rocking around, they're still bouncing, they just cannot seem to settle. And it would be important to sort of think, okay, maybe we, we were too still, we had really long car journey today, maybe trying to unpick a little bit as to reasons why um, perhaps that child is still needing extra bits of movement even by the end of the day. So if we can drip feed it, that's probably the best way to still try and help keep that um, sensory system topped up. If your child though is very fearful, it's really important to try and go at their pace and give them safe opportunities for moving around where maybe at first they might be at ground level. So if you are taking even a duvet cover off, laying that on the ground and putting a couple of pillows underneath and encouraging them to crawl, to roll over it, to just take those first steps towards developing a bit of extra confidence when they're moving, holding onto their hand, giving some pressure through their shoulders, perhaps if they were to be like bouncing or rocking on, on a stability ball, but making sure that their feet touch the ground so they can still have that sense of being connected um, to ground level. Um, and then, you know, 
taking them to the park, low level beams, if they're um, able to tolerate that, or even just walking on unlevel ground and uneven surfaces will provide them that little bit of input at a slower pace until they develop that extra confidence. So when we're looking as well at the sensory systems, I like to use the analogy a bit of a car because most children can relate to that. Um, but also for ourselves, it's just about us aiming to be in that just right state of sensory arousal. And none of us are here for the entire day ever. Our systems will fluctuate. We might feel that our, our sensory responses you know, are heightened, um, whether we're angry, we're frustrated, we're stressed, um, too much going on, and you feel like you cannot cope with extra demands, and you need to use your own strategies to try and calm. Um, you might need to take a five minute break, you might need to go for a walk, you might need to read your book, you might need to just complete change of setting, a change of pace, in order for you to feel like you are in control. And the same goes for our children because when they're not in that just right state and they're going too high, too fast, they're not in a, a good emotional or even sensory state of regulation to be able to learn, to take in information, to listen to your instructions, to follow through with expectations within the home environment or within their nursery or school setting. So if they are functioning too high and it seems like their responses are almost like the car is going to crash, that's when we need to implement some strategies for calming. And we're going to talk about what calming strategies might be useful for you in the next slide. But just want to talk about if your car is running low or slow, you're, you're tired, you're very lethargic, you can't seem to get yourself going. You know, us as adults, we might exercise, we might put some water on our face, we might um, have a caffeinated drink, do something to just like sort of rev our own engines up a little bit. And the same goes for our children. So, you know, I've got a lot of um, school aged ones who just struggle to get out of bed in the morning. So we try and look at it across all different senses, how to try and alert their system. So if we move on to that, the alerting, for example, um, just the second part of this slide, it's when you want to look at, okay, what things could they look at that might help wake them up? Would it be a bright light? Gonna come in, open up the curtains. Perhaps it's also um, your voice or music that might help wake them up a little bit. Um, perhaps the breakfast that you choose, whether it's strong tastes that might help to alert their system engaging in very rapid, high intensity movements. So where you're constantly changing directions, the, the, the amplitude, you're, you're low, you're high, you're, um, you're going fast and then you're changing it to slow. You might be spinning more. That, all those types of movements will really help to ramp the, the sensory system up and, and, and alert them and get them a bit more aware of their surroundings and what's happening next. So some children who may not participate in an activity like dressing because they often don't really recognize their body and how they're moving through space. Well, let's give them a nice rub with some um, cream and then maybe with a towel as well too, play some clapping games, do something to make them aware and draw their attention to their arm before it has to go through the sleeve of, of a t-shirt or a jumper, something like that but you also might do things like the rough and tumble play, which one parent had mentioned, because that really helps to keep them in a, in a regulated state. It just is enough to, to meet the threshold for their system to get them going and keep them uh, in, in an alert state of arousal. If the car though, like I said, is, is revving too high and too fast and it looks like they're going to crash, or if you want to call it a meltdown or a tantrum, perhaps you have your own uh, words that you would use to describe your child running too high. Um, what we want to do is offer opportunities where we can dampen down a lot of that stimulation. And it's about, I guess, suppose trying to press a bit of a pause button where we are slowing down even the sights and sounds that are coming in to their, um, their system. So might need to change room, closing curtains, turning off lights, 
putting on some uh, calming music, if that does help them, perhaps using weight, and that could be just through a, a duvet, or if they have a weighted blanket, or if they are responsive to massage, or perhaps you have a ball that you can roll over top of them, anything to really try and calm the system down. And deep pressure is excellent for that. It is a surefire way to um, get, gain an immediate sense of calm. And that's, I suppose, why things like massage, yoga, um, are so beneficial to the system and it's an automatic like almost instant reaction that we get from that so it's a different kind of pressure than the alerting because you can still use pressure when you're trying to alert your child but you would be doing it slightly differently with some of the more high intensity you know bumping into them falling it's it's a bit more i guess disorganized the way that it looks because you're trying to really keep them engaged Whereas with the calming, you need to have something which is more steady, which is more rhythmic and slow. So you probably wouldn't spin so much, but you might want to do some kind of linear swinging, the back and forth movement, you, you know, take yourselves back to when your children were, you know, tiny babies. And that's sort of our natural response, isn't it? To try and calm a child down is by rocking them and, and, and swaddling them as well too. So this, it's just the same principles but basing it on what age they're at, what equipment you might have to hand, also using your own body like a tool. Um, because if you can be the one to give some of that pressure, that will be also a nice form of connection that you have with your child too. And you as a parent or carer are your child's prime regulator. So it's just important to always bear that in mind that they might be coming to you because they know that you get them and you'll be able to deliver something like a huge bear cuddle or you'll squish them between some of your sofa cushions and lay down on top of them because that brings them an enormous sense of, of calm and it, it makes their system feel good. So it's about getting a lot of their feedback too. Um, and if your child isn't verbal, using their facial expressions and um, any vocalizations that they might be making to indicate ah, uh, this feels good, right? And, and we can gain that from, from our children in that way. There is a link that you're gonna see when you get the notes. Um, this is just about a, a sensory path, um, which is similar to an obstacle course, but doesn't use any equipment. Some of you may be familiar with it. It really just uses a piece of concrete and a piece of chalk to be able to map out a little bit of a, of a circuit for your child to follow, which can be really helpful, um, not only from their motor component, but also just in terms of getting them to focus on an activity after that. Um, so there might be different movements you have them do, different sequences of jumping or hopping. They might be following lines that go in different directions. Um, they can be, uh, you know, you can incorporate numbers and letters into it if you want. Um, it just gives you a couple of examples and there's many on YouTube as well too that um, can be very beneficial to a sensory system um, and you can take wherever you go really. So it's, um, it's quite effective. So the proprioception, we, we spoke about it a little bit. Uh, we're trying to increase a child's body awareness if they're having difficulty monitoring how they're moving through space or some people who need to have a lot of that extra input through deep pressure. So the, it's important to know that the receptors for this system are located in our muscles and joints. So for the parents and carers who've mentioned about their children needing so much rough and tumble play, falling on purpose, bashing into things. It's almost like they're, um, you know, trying to fight, like, you know, they can be misinterpreted a little bit as, oh, your, your child is so rough, or, you know, why are you always running into me? Or you're like constantly pushing into the wall. They need to have that input on a regular basis again. So think about that every 90 minutes at least because after that period of time, the effect of all of that high intensity, deep pressure input starts to wear off. So you need to keep giving the system more and more and more. The more intense you can be, even for a short period of time, the more the benefit will be. 
You, know, you might hear children saying or teachers, oh, I gave him a movement break because I gave your child a piece of paper to, to take to the office. And that is a movement break, but it's not going to feed their system with a huge amount of, of deep pressure, right? They, that would be the child who, I'm gonna give you all the library books to carry and, and distribute around, you know, something which is heavier, something which, you know, they're having to really work their muscles and that will increase their consciousness of how it is that they're moving through space. So your child might be that risk taker and their need for pressure is almost above and beyond them being able to, to look at an environment and say, well, I'm not going to jump from there because that's dangerous. All they can see is an opportunity to fall and to feel their body. So trying to create safe opportunities for this at home and you know, pulling off sofa cushions and getting your child to do that as well, because again, that is a lot of good heavy based work, you know, um, making forts, um, so moving some of the smaller furniture out of the way so that they don't injure themselves, launching themselves onto, um, on or off the sofa. Uh, if you've got therapy balls as well too, launching off of them. Um, all of this is going to be really good as is things like jumping, star jumps, uh, any type of sort of, uh, stamping, marching your feet, uh, putting on some music and really just having an intense push um, you know, tug of war kind of situation. Like you can, you can do anything. Even the yoga would be something which would be appropriate for delivering a lot of deep pressure input uh, into your child's system. Um, what I was just going to mention though is obviously not every child is that keen on the deep pressure and what you might find if they do have something like poor body awareness and don't seem to be comfortable when they're moving through space. They look very closely at their hands and what their arms are doing. So they wouldn't be able to put on a shirt, let's say with buttons and, and, and do it without looking. Um, anytime they manipulate small items, they're looking so closely at their hands and what they're doing because they need that visual feedback because they haven't got the body awareness down pat yet, or we haven't given them enough cues relating to their body awareness. So if, if you notice these things or they have very poor balance as well and um, seem to be uncoordinated, it could be that they need some intervention to really try and offer these opportunities um, for, for the deep pressure throughout the day. And again, you know, like I said, every 90 minutes, if you can just be pushing, pulling, lifting, carrying, wearing heavy rucksacks, helping with the shopping, doing anything like that around the house, recycling bins, your laundry baskets, doing all and, you know, any of those activities would be really, really helpful. So interoception now, um, so we touched on it a little bit at the start, but like I said, it's a person's ability to gain some information about things like, is it hot or is it cold? So am I dressed appropriately for the weather? Do I sense this? Um, am I hungry? Uh, and my thirsty as well too. Many children don't get those sensations, nor do they feel when it's time to go to the toilet. Um, with the toileting, I just also always um, have mentioned this in some of my other talks that I gave, is that just really important to ascertain that your child's actual sensation in that area is normal. Um, and you can go to your pediatrician if they can do some testing of sort of the, the, the skin areas um, just to make sure that, you know, there's no damage to any nerves or anything like that would be important to ascertain first and foremost. And that also to be mindful that if your child has very high levels of anxiety, it, very, it could well be that it's much more difficult for them to pick up on some of these cues because to have a constant flurry of, of butterflies in your tummy, or however you might want to describe the anxiety, um, it can mask and it can make it very difficult for them to pick up on these cues. So if they're very anxious and they're not drinking, they're even more dysregulated um, by not having enough fluid in them, or if they're constantly moving all the time and burning so many calories, because they're anxious, or maybe just that's how their system works. And if they're not getting enough, um, you know, snacks and nutrition throughout the day, it's really important to be mindful that sometimes, 
you know, their dysregulation and inability to focus or, or you know, uh, do, a, do an activity with you is often because of, of these prime elements over here in interoception. So for the ones who move around a lot, I, I would suggest, you know, always having snacks on you, um, not denying them, I suppose, if they, if they needed it. And, you know, looking at how your child is moving, it is natural that they're going to be hungry if, if they don't sit still and if they're constantly on the move. Um, if often they don't even think about having a drink unless they see a bottle that's there. So if your child is going to be returning to school or starting school, making sure that it's offered or it's on their desk all the time and that they are constantly being given drink because you know when you're dehydrated, it's really easy that you develop a headache. Um, and then of course, your, your car is not going to be in that calm, um, in control state of arousal. You're, you're, you're gonna feel quite poorly. Often with the temperature regulation, this is one that can be quite difficult to, to target and often requires a little bit of discussion, I suppose, or using of visuals with the child about looking at the weather and choosing clothing appropriately and having multiple layers that they can then take off or put on, looking in the mirror and saying, well, look, you're, you're sweating, your, uh, your face is red, why don't we try and put some water on there? We'll take your jumper off and recognize um, whether, the, whether the child feels better as a result of having done these things so that as with habit, you know, they can start to initiate things like that themselves. So we touched on this a little bit about the, the body awareness and how it's so important to bear in mind that pressure can rev the system up if you're feeling that you need alerting, but it'll also calm you down. Um, and if you can use your own body, that is fantastic because if you're out, um, you know, on a, on a family trip or on an outing or some nature, you can't bring all of your sensory kit with you. You know, we can't travel with our, our therapy balls and our blankets and all of the fidget toys that we have. But what we can do is give our child squeezes. We can give some downward pressure. We can maybe get a heavy rucksack onto them and give your child that responsibility of carrying the snacks. Um, you know, even things like pushing hands together and pulling them apart, um, using perhaps some resistive clay in the car, like putty or something just in the journey so that they have something to squeeze and manipulate. And again, to use a lot of deep pressure to help relieve some maybe low level anxiety they might be experiencing. Um, as long as it's safe and you're confident that they're not going to put it in their mouth, um, you know, if they're sitting in the back seat, then you know you want to be mindful that they're um, they're not going to ingest it. Um, but like I said, a lot of that heavy work of doing the push, pull, lift, and carry is important to consider. So if you've got a long journey coming up potentially in the summer, it's worth thinking after about an hour, an hour and a half, you know, those 90 minutes to think stop at a at a service station. Give your child an opportunity to have a run around, get some high intensity, some deep pressure, um, that, that feeding of the system, that input that they need to make the next part of the journey um, bearable, I suppose, and, and that they, they don't then have that car that goes into um, out of control state of arousal. Okay. So these are just a couple of signs that you might recognize um, when sensory overload happens. And the unfortunate thing is that many of them can go undetected, especially in a, a big classroom uh, or you know, nursery setting, if there's many other children there, or um, if you've got you know, a lot of people over for a family gathering and you know, your child is showing many of these things, it, it can almost be masked as, oh, they're just being very quiet. But perhaps internally, you know, or if you look more closely, you might notice that their pupils are dilated, that they have flushed face, um, or almost like a frozen expression. Um, they could be shaking or trembling a little bit or going quite stiff and rigid. And again, unless you looked really closely or actually physically touched them, that might be difficult to, to recognize. Um, they might have stomach cramps. So unless they've told you, again, that's something which is 
difficult to know. Um, when it's extreme, it can lead to diarrhea and vomiting as well too. They might be sweating excessively, but again, a child who's wearing a school polo and then a jumper on top, unless you've touched their back or touched their skin, you might not recognize that that's happening. Um, it can lead to dizziness and disorientation and the racing thoughts going through their mind. And often the sad thing is that our children, you know, go through a whole day trying to mask a lot of their anxiety or their sensory behaviors because they know that, well, I'm in school now and, and the teacher wants me to sit still and I'm, I'm not allowed to go to the toilet. I can't really move. So they're suppressing, suppressing, suppressing throughout the entire day and it's like that kettle that's on low boil but by the time you meet them at the school gate they just can't contain it anymore you are their their safe person you'll love them regardless of what they do and it explodes and the, then we start having these conversations of oh but they they do everything i ask them at school and then at home the parents and carers have a much more difficult time trying to manage the fact that some of this sensory um, seeking, whether it's the behaviors or you know, masking the anxiety um, was kept, tried to be kept at bay throughout the entire day. And it's really exhausting for a child as well too. So if you have this pattern, it's worth having a discussion you know, and figuring out ways that you know, we can educate um, other people who are with our child uh, so that they are familiar with what our child's sensory profile looks like and the strategies that you use at home or the equipment that you use at home that we try and replicate within their other environments. And that could be a learning environment, but could even be at grandma and granddad's house, you know, that they have the capacity to still perhaps engage in that rough and tumble play. They can move about, they can get the deep pressure, they can block off noise and um, sights if they need to. It's making everybody aware um, to help um, our, ch our children to be as calm and regulated as possible. And that's really the basis of the sensory diet because what in essence we're trying to do is either, either give the input that the child needs to stay calm and regulated or remove it if it's heightening them to a point where they can't function. So it varies for every child, and it might even vary depending on the day, where the child is, what environment they're in, what demands are being placed on them. So it's this detective all the time, because if you know, for example, that your child really struggles with transitions and they throw things, you might say, okay, right, um, let's use some pressure beforehand. Let's give a countdown. We'll use a visual timer. We will give the child something like a balloon to, to carry uh, so that if it did get thrown, it wouldn't hurt anyone. So choosing the right activity, perhaps they also need to be at the back of the queue because when they're at the front, all the other children or other siblings if you're going out the door are jostling them a little bit and that's setting their sensory system off a little bit so it's really unpicking and looking at the behaviors that you generally tend to see within the course of the day and do we need to give calming or do we need to give alerting activities to this child um, so it's never, like I said, it's never going to be the same. It's never going to be at 9 a.m. You're going to do 20 star jumps. And then, 11, you know, 10, 30, an hour and a half later, you'll do um, some wall push-ups or you will carry the recycling box. Because maybe one day your child is going to need more. Maybe another day they'll have had a great sleep. They'll have had breakfast when normally they don't. They're, they've met more of their sensory needs. And they don't need to have as much of the input as the previous day. So again, it is all about education. It's about working alongside your occupational therapist. Um, you know, we all have to communicate to one another how best to, to meet the needs of the child. And it's about having multiple strategies and many tools in your tool belt to be able to offer the child. And again, if your child is nonverbal, but you have visuals that could say, oh, here is a picture of my therapy ball. Here is a picture of my my cushion or I, this is the room that I can go in to do some other activities. Um, this is where my putty is kept or this is where I can go and use my dark den. You know, if they can see that and, and pick it or start to guide you towards it, 
this is our child's way of communicating. I need this right now for my system to be calm and alert. Can you help me to achieve that? Um, and that's how we build on a sensory diet. So it's, um, it can be a wonderful thing if it's done correctly, but it's changing all the time. So it always has to be reviewed as well. And then I just like to end a little bit with um, how important it is to have these moments of calm and stillness, especially in the world that we're living in now, not only for our children, but obviously for ourselves too. Um, that we're in the very technological age, obviously, and whether it's devices or you know, the news that's on, we seem to always have to be switched on and, and focused on something and, and doing all the time. And many of our children don't really have that opportunity during the day to just stop for a moment and connect a little bit more with what's happening inside them. And whether you call it mindfulness or meditation or just practicing to breathe and taking very deep, calming, regulating breaths, we probably don't really recognize ourselves that we all often don't tend to do that very much in the day. Our breathing becomes very shallow and rapid and all that does is fuels more anxiety. It, it brings that car into more of an elevated, out of control state. And it can be really hard to then come out of it and, and calm the system down. So if we, we try again and implement a little bit of, of downtime and being mindful of what happens when I fill my, my lungs with, with air. And for some children, this is really, really difficult, especially if they're mouth breathers. So if you have younger children and you, know, you can use some party filler um, toys, often ones which need a lot of deep exhalation to maybe create a little bit of a spin on, on an uh, airplane propeller, or it might hover a little um, plastic ball on some of them. They need really, really deep, deep exhalation. Using straws and cotton wool could be another um, fun activity for them to do. So there's ways to try and still teach taking a deep breath you know, three to five at any one point in time can be that reset button that, that not only we need as adults, but sometimes the, the child or the children that we're working alongside and trying to help need as well. And it can be, again, really beneficial for reducing their anxiety and just being mindful of what's happening inside. Like, oh, I feel like my, my chest is expanding or I feel my tummy going up because I have my hand on it and I take a deep breath and using balloons to try and illustrate that a little bit can be very helpful. This is a resource you're gonna to have too when you get your, um, your notes. There is a course that's being offered by the Sensory Integration Network. Um, it is uh, directed towards uh, parents and carers about some extrasensory processing strategies. I haven't done it, but um, it's just, I get um, these things emailed to me and it's, I think it's five pounds so if it was something that you wanted to look at, I think it's a pre-recorded uh, course. And once you order it, it's available for three months. And then there are two books by Carol Stock Kranowitz, which really does help to explain sensory processing, what difficulties you might see in your child. There's tables um, with a lot of like explanations that might be really useful if, if you want to find out about more or if perhaps a family member because I don't really know what sensory processing is, you know, and, and it, can, it can help to answer a lot of their questions. And the Out of Sync Child Has Fun gives a lot of um, activities that again, you might um, get for, for calming or for alerting. So that's, uh, that brings us to the end of the presentation.